again this evening. We appreciate the presence of everyone. I hope you've got your Bible with you. And even though we're going to be looking at some first principle things, that you'll follow along in our study this evening. We began this morning looking at these very passages as we looked at a first principle lesson this morning, that the first principles that are dealt with, that phrase as it's used in Hebrews chapter 5 and in verse 12, we noticed that when we got to chapter 6 and verse 1, it deals with the foundations. Notice in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of, and then you enumerate some of the foundation. And so what we learn from that is the first principles are the foundations we build upon. We are in danger when we begin to neglect or to forget the basics, the first principles that are found in the scriptures. And I reminded you this morning of a text or of a uh, statement that Urban Lee said to me a number of years ago that when we teach school, we teach first grade every year. And that's why we need to go again and again back to the first principles. This morning we talked about grace and faith and works. Tonight I want us to look at John chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn to John chapter 3. We're going to spend most of our time in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. Not a person present who is old enough to be accountable does not, is not in a, or anyone who is accountable, I think, understands the subject we're going to be talking about. It's another matter of being able to explain that to our friends and neighbors as to what the text is talking about when Jesus uses the phrase being born again. Here's what Jesus said in verse 3 of John chapter 3. We'll look at the context later. But Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Two verses later he said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus said one must be born again. Jesus said, what he means by that is being born of the water and of the Spirit. That's when you are born again. So Jesus declared that one must be born again. Most of what we would refer to in a loose fashion, and I put in quotations, Christianity, most of those who claim to be followers of Christ, claim to be born again. However, there's a lot of confusion as to what that may mean. Some think that the new birth refers to some kind of Holy Spirit baptism. Being born of water and of the Spirit means that you are born of the Spirit in the sense that you are overwhelmed with Holy Spirit baptism. Others think that it refers to the work of purification by the Spirit to change our will, a Calvinistic kind of view. Others think that perhaps this is a natural or physical birth, even though much of the context of John 3 is arguing this is not a physical material birth. Some think that this is talking about a physical birth, and others think that the term water means spirit. That when the Bible talks about being born of water, that it's talking about being born of the spirit. We'll say more about that here in just a moment. So our question for tonight is, what is the new birth, and can we understand it? There seemed to be one in the context, Nicodemus, who did not understand it fully, and Jesus seeks to explain it. Can we understand what the new birth is and how do we explain the new birth? So let's talk tonight about the new birth, another first principle fundamental study. Let's go back to John chapter 3. And I want us to notice in John chapter 3 that a teacher from God demands the new birth. That's the story of John 3. A teacher from God who is Christ demands the new birth. Now let's notice some things in the context. First of all, let's go back to John 3. If you haven't gone back there and opened your Bible to John 3, we'll spend some time there. Let's subdivide some things in John chapter 3. Beginning at verses 1 and 2, we have a man named Nicodemus who comes to Jesus. Let's read verses 1 and 2. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God and no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, what do we know about this Nicodemus? Well, first of all, he's a Pharisee, verse 1 says. He's religious because he's a Pharisee. 
I know he's religious because he comes to Jesus and talks about religious things. No one can do the things you do unless God is with him, he said. Furthermore, he's probably of the Sanhedrin. We'll give evidence of that as the lesson unfolds. So he's probably a member of the Sanhedrin Council. Verse 2 said he was a teacher, he was a rabbi, because Jesus said to him at verse 10, he said, are you a teacher in Israel and you do not know these things? And so he's quite involved in religious matters. He is perhaps a rabbi. He is on the Sanhedrin council, we think. He's religious, he's a Pharisee. Now verse 2 says he came to Jesus by night. Why did he come to Jesus by night? And the answer is, we really don't know for sure. But there may be some indication because that phrase is used three times in the New Testament about identifying him as a man who came to Jesus by night. Let's go to John chapter 7 and look at verses 50 to 52. John chapter 7, verses 50 to 52. The Sanhedrin council is after Jesus and they want the, the, uh, some of the Jews to go and seize Jesus and bring him to them. So beginning at verse 45, they asked, why haven't they brought him? And the officer said, no one ever spoke like this man, was their response. Nicodemus defends Jesus. That's what I want you to see here in this discussion. Beginning at verse 50, Nicodemus, now notice the phrase, he who came to Jesus by night being one of them, that's why I think he's of the Sanhedrin council, said to them, Do, does our law judge a man before it hears him? And knows what he is doing. And they said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. What I want you to see is Nicodemus defended Jesus here. But he doesn't make great commitment to Jesus that I am following him and I am his follower. And I am saying he's innocent. But he said, do do we judge a, a man? Does our law judge a man before we hear him? Seemed to be some defense of Jesus. But it's interesting he says that's said in the context of identifying him as the man who came to Jesus by night. But perhaps more interesting than that is go over to the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John. And I raise it verses 38 and 39. And I raise this as a question. Is this a parallel? And I just raise it as a question. I'm not sure it is, but it may be. And you perhaps have this noted in your Bible from a study of the Gospel of John. Notice at verse 38. That Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Joseph of Arimathea was a follower of Christ, but a secret follower. He wasn't out in the public letting it be known, but he was a secret follower because he feared the Jews. Then Nicodemus is mentioned at verse 39, who first came to Jesus by night. And I've often wondered, are those parallel phrases... That uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret disciple, and Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, indicating perhaps he was a secret disciple, a follower in some sense, but not willing to make that commitment. But whatever the case may be about that, I want us to go back to John chapter 3. And look at verse 2. In John chapter 3 and verse 2, I want you to notice he made this conclusion. His conclusion was, no one can do the signs you do unless God is with him. He concluded, this man is from God. And that's the man we're dealing with. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus, verses 1 and 2. Beginning at verse 3 through verse 7, Jesus teaches on the new birth. So here's what Jesus said to him. He said to him at verse 3, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this is the man who just said, no one can do the things you do unless God's with him. Well, let me tell you, Jesus said, that unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, look at verse 4. Nicodemus questions that how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Are you talking about a physical birth? How can he be born again? I don't get this. Are, are Are you talking about somehow going back into his mother's womb and being born a second time? What are you talking about? So at verse 5, Jesus said, I'm talking about being born of water and the Spirit. Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's what I mean by the new birth. Jesus goes further in verses 6 and 7 to say this is a spiritual birth I'm talking about. He said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. You're talking, Nicodemus, about fleshly birth, being born from your mother's womb. He said that's not what I'm talking about. That which is of the flesh is flesh. 
But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, he says. Do not marvel that I say to you must be born again. This is not that of amazing thing, he said. This ought to be something you can follow. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. I'm not talking about a physical birth. Now, beginning at verse 8 through verse 12 is an explanation of the new birth. So we have Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Jesus teaches on the new birth. You must be born again. Don't marvel that I say you must be born again, he said. Now, beginning at verse 8, here's an explanation of that. Verse 8 is emphasizing this is not a fleshly birth. Let's read verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You might underline that everyone in your text. That'll be helpful to you as you are in a discussion with someone about the new birth, particularly if they abuse verse 8. I want you to notice what the comparison is, and that's why we emphasize and underline that word everyone. The comparison is not the new birth and the wind. Jesus is not saying the new birth is like the wind. The wind blows where it wishes and you can't see where it comes from or where it goes and so is the new birth. That's not what he said. That's not what he said at all. The comparison is between the wind and the one that's born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you cannot see where it comes from or where it goes and so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus had objected on the basis that he didn't understand. We saw that earlier in verse 4. I don't understand what you're talking about. And Jesus is saying you ought not to object to this because just because you can't see what we're talking about. That is, you don't fully grasp everything. There are things about the winds you don't fully grasp and understand, and yet you don't deny that. The wind blows where it wishes. It comes and goes, and, and you don't see where it came from. You can't see it coming, and you can't see it going. You can only see the effects thereof. So what Jesus is doing in verse 8 is refuting the idea that this is a physical birth. It is the unseen part of man that is born. You don't see physical changes. You see only the effects. In other words, you don't look at someone and say, well, I know you're, you're a Christian, you've been born again, because your hair is different, and your face is different, and your, your body looks different. You don't see those physical changes. You see the effects of being born again. And so the wind blows where it wishes. You don't know where it comes from or where it goes. You don't see that. And so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now, in verse 9, we're still developing the context. Nicodemus asked, how could this be, he said. He said, how can these things be? He seems to be perplexed. In other words, how could he, being a ruler among the Jews, not already be in the kingdom? Jesus, you're telling me that I've got to be born again to enter the kingdom, and how could it be that I'm not in the kingdom already? And I say he's perplexed because that was the common concept of the Jews. You remember in John chapter 8, in verse 32, Jesus said, you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And that was offensive to the Jews because they said, we're Abraham's seed and never been in bondage to any man. How sayest thou you should be made free? What do you mean we need freedom? It seems as if Nicodemus is saying, what do you mean I need to be in the king? I thought I was already there. And they thought because they were of Israel, they were of Israel, Romans chapter 9. Now Jesus answers that beginning at verse 10. Notice at verse 10, he said, being a teacher, you ought to know these things. Look at verse 10. He said, are you a teacher in Israel and you don't know these things? Not so much focusing merely on the new birth, but the spiritual aspect of that. And so why should he being a teacher in Israel, being a rabbi, familiar with the law and with the prophets? Well, he should have been familiar with Deuteronomy 18 that Moses has said that God would raise up a prophet like unto him. He should have been watching for that and understood that if he was familiar with Deuteronomy. If he even had a smattering knowledge of the book of Jeremiah, he should have understood Jeremiah and said there would be a new covenant come, not like the old covenant. Something new and different is coming. He should have understood that. Notice further, Jesus says at verse 11, he said, most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. In other words, the testimony that I've given you and that has been given to you and will be given to you is given by credible witnesses, and yet you do not accept that. 
Now notice verse 12 to finish that section before we go on. Notice he said, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? What's he talking about? He is simply saying, if you don't accept the earthly things of what you must do, that you must be born of the water and of the Spirit, you're not going to accept the, earthly, the heavenly things that you learn by revelation. Things like beginning at verse 13. Let's get a hint. Notice at verse 13, he said, No one has ascended into heaven, but he that came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And as Moses was lifted up, uh, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Here are things you'll learn by revelation. And if you don't understand what I've already told you, you're not going to grasp the things you learn by revelation. And so a teacher from God demands the new birth. Now, let's, let's move from that. Now, we know the context and the discussion between Nicodemus and Jesus and, and the, the questions Nicodemus was raising and Jesus responding to him. I want us to understand that its meaning is simple. This is not hard. This is not difficult. This is a spiritual birth, obviously. Verse 6, let's go back to our context and establish again. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit, he said. So it's a spiritual birth we're talking about. He's not talking about being born of the flesh, born of the Spirit. So this is a spiritual birth. Verse 8, we've already given emphasis. The comparison is not to the wind and the new birth, but to the wind and the one who is born. This is a spiritual birth. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effects. It is that unseen part of man that is born again, not physical changes. So it's a simple thing, a spiritual birth. The new birth is simply having reference to obedience to the truth. And here's how we know that. So what I'm doing now is not so much teaching you some information you don't know, but maybe showing you how you show your neighbor what the new birth involves. So I would show my neighbor and my friend that this is what's involved in the new birth. It's in order to enter the kingdom. So what, when I can find what the Bible says about entering the kingdom then I understand something about the new birth. Now go back to verse 3. You must be born again to enter the kingdom. Verse 5 of our text says you must be born of water and of the Spirit to enter the kingdom. So if I can find elsewhere what I need to do to enter the kingdom, that's what the new birth must involve. So let's go to Matthew 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. When you do the will of the Father, then you enter the kingdom. That's the new birth. You say, what's involved in the new birth? It's simply obedience to the gospel. Being born of the water and of the spirit, that's obedience to the gospel. That's what you have to do to enter the kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 18 in verse 3, except you be converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Furthermore, I know it's obedience to the truth because this is where new life begins. This is where new life begins. So when one is born again, that's where new life begins. So if I can find in the New Testament where new life begins, then that's the point at which I'm born again. So let's go to Romans chapter 6. Let's turn over to Romans the 6th chapter. And notice in Romans chapter 6 beginning at verse 3, Do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Now verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, just as Jesus was raised up, from the dead by the glory of the Father. Now watch this. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we're raised from the waters of baptism to walk in a new and a different life. That's your new birth. It's where new life begins. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5 and in verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So once I'm in Christ, I'm a new creature. I've been born again because new life begins. So it harmonizes with what we just said about entering the kingdom. But let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. If you want as clear an explanation of the new birth, 1 Peter chapter 1 makes that point as clear as any text. So let's look at the context of 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning about verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 18. Verse 18 and 19 said we're redeemed by the blood of Christ. Knowing you're not redeemed by corruptible things like silver and gold... But verse 19, by the precious blood of Christ is a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now notice at verse 22, I'm redeemed by the blood conditioned on obedience. Seeing you have purified your souls in, you might underline, obeying the truth. Now notice he said you do that, your souls have become pure. How? By obedience to the truth. Now notice also verse 23, 
being born again. Now notice this connection. Look at verse 22. Verse 22 says, you purified your souls in obeying the truth. Now then at verse 23, having been born again. You might draw a connection between those two phrases in your Bible. And that is obeying the truth and being born again are used synonymously in this context. As we mentioned this morning, this is how the Bible is its own best commentary. What do you mean by being born again, Peter? I'm talking about obeying the truth. What do you mean by obeying the truth? I'm talking about being born again. When I obey the truth and purify my souls, I've been born again. There's your Bible explanation of what it means to be born again, being born of water and the Spirit. But a further explanation that it's obedience to the truth is looking at parallel passages. What do we mean by that? Let's find some passages where the same three elements are found. We have in John chapter 3 being born of water and of the Spirit and the result is you enter the kingdom. Now we can find the same three things but worded differently in other texts. And let's see if we can find those. So let's go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. And it might be helpful to in John chapter 3 write out to the side that 1 Corinthians 12 13 is a parallel text to that. Here's what the parallel text will say. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Well, obviously being in the kingdom and being in the one body is one and the same thing. Being in the church, being in the kingdom are one and the same. We'll say more about that in a moment. Being uh, uh, born of the spirit and by one spirit must be the same thing. More evidence of that perhaps as we go further. Baptism and water are the, uh, the water is the only, or baptism is the only thing water is connected with in the New Testament. More about that in a moment. So this passage must be talking about the same kind of thing. And that is we're born of water and of the spirit to enter the kingdom. Or another way of wording that, you're baptized by one spirit to enter the body of Christ. Now let's look at another text and we'll wrap these together in a moment. Let's go to Titus 3 and in verse 5. We were in Titus 3 this morning as we talked about being saved by the grace of God. But I want you to notice the wording at verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done. We use that phrase this morning. But according to his mercy, he saved us. Now what does he say about that salvation? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So by his grace, he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now that's wording that's a little difficult for us. But we have the same three elements that we saw in John 3 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We have the Spirit involved. We have a washing involved. We have water and baptism involved. Let's notice a fourth parallel passage. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it, that is the church, with the washing of water by the word. Now let's start over here at the end. And that is being in the kingdom, being in the body, being saved and cleansing must refer to the same thing. That's different ways of talking about salvation. One, one might become saved by the blood of Christ. One might be cleansed by the blood of Christ. One might enter the kingdom by the blood of Christ. You enter into one body by the blood of Christ. Let's talk about the same thing, isn't it? All right, let's look at the second column. We have the spirit, one spirit, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's obvious those are parallel, but by the word. How is the word parallel? It's not the word and the Holy Spirit are one and the same, but the word is the tool or the instrument the Spirit uses, Ephesians 6, 17. It is the sword of the Spirit. Take with you the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, the instrument of the Spirit. The Spirit has revealed the word. So when the word teaches something, the Spirit is teaching that. Well, now we have baptism and washing of water and by the word. So what? As I take these parallel texts where all three elements are used, what conclusion do I come to? That the text is saying when one is baptized by the instruction of the word given by the Spirit, then they are saved. That's all John 3, 5 is saying. Being born of water and of the Spirit to enter the kingdom is the same as saying when one is baptized by the teaching of the word of God, then they receive salvation. That's all it's saying. And I learned that from looking at these parallel texts. And I learned that from looking at 1 John, or 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, and looking at parallel phrases as we have already considered. Now let's look at some key elements. I know a teacher from God demands the new birth. 
Secondly, I know it's simple in its meaning. Let's talk about some key elements that are involved. And that is there's water and there is the Spirit. Water must refer to baptism. Let's give some evidence of that. Some think that the water refers to the Spirit. And I suggest to you that that's absurd. Because had Jesus uh, meant uh, Spirit by the term water, what he's saying is that you must be born of the Spirit and of the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. And you want to explain to me what the first Spirit is and what the second Spirit is? You want to explain what the differences are? And why he needed to mention spirit and spirit? That seems to be absurd, doesn't it? And I wonder about this question, and that is, what word could have been used to mean water? What if Jesus had wanted to mean water? But he used water, but that's not what he meant. But what if he had wanted to mean water? What word would he have used? Would it be something different than water, or would it have been water? It would seem it would be water, if that's what he meant to use. And if that's what he meant to imply, and that's the word that he did use. The connection that water has to the kingdom is baptism. I don't know of another thing that the water has reference to or a connection to with reference to the kingdom of God than baptism. In Acts chapter 8, we see a case when the Ethiopian eunuch wanted to be baptized. He said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? In the conversion of Cornelius, Acts 10, 48, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized who receive the spirit as well as we? It's the only thing in the New Testament that is connected with water. Now, what about the Spirit? The term Spirit has reference to being led through the Spirit, that is, through the Spirit's Word, through the Spirit's Revelation. Now, we've already mentioned this, but I want to give you the passages where we have the evidence. Ephesians 3, 3 through 5, the Spirit has revealed the Word. Now it's been written down. That was the Spirit's work. The Spirit uses the Word to accomplish His task. Again, it's the sword of the Spirit. So the Spirit could be said to function, but the Word could be saying to be functioning the same thing, and yet that's not a contradiction at all. That we are saved by the Spirit of God, we're saved by the Word of God because the Spirit operates and functions indeed through the Word. In fact, the Bible talks about being born of the Spirit, John 3, 5, but we're begotten through the Gospel, 1 Corinthians 4, 15. Is Is that a contradiction? I'm born of the, I thought I was born of the Spirit, not of the Gospel. It's because the gospel is the spirit's revelation that those two passages can indeed be harmonized. Now let's talk about the change that one experiences with the new birth. Suppose one is born again. What change takes place with reference to them? What change does one experience? Well, first of all, they enter the kingdom. Go back to John 3, verse 3. Jesus said, except one be born again, he he shall not enter the kingdom of God. Or see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, man must be born of the water and the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. Well, that's the same as being saved. Colossians chapter 1 shows that those who were saved by the blood of Christ, verse 14, were in the kingdom, verse 13. So those in the kingdom were saved by the blood. So that's one and the same. Being in the kingdom is the same as being saved. Being in the kingdom is the same as being in the church. Jesus uses those terms interchangeably. I will build my church and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. He uses those interchangeably. So to enter the kingdom means you enter the church and you're saved. One and the same thing. You become God's child. That's the change that takes place. Now for the first time, God is our father. Before one is born again, they may call God their father, but in a true sense, they is not their father. Without reading all of these passages, Romans 1, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1, the phrase of God our Father is used repeatedly. So for the first time God is now our Father, I'm now His child, I've been born again. We are His sons, we are His children, we are the sons of God. That's what 1 John 3 is about, being the sons or the children of God. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8, the significance of of being a son or a child of God means that we're now heirs of God. Look at verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God, the children of God. Now verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If you are a child of God, and there is evidence you are a child of God, verse 16. Evidence is given, verse 16. How you know then that automatically makes you an heir of God to receive the inheritance from your father. So what change takes place? We enter the kingdom, we become God's child. 
There's a change in life that takes place. You're born anew, born different. This is where a new life begins. It's where you start over. Here's some other figures that make the same kind of expression. The idea of adoption, you are adopted. A change in relationship has taken place. Romans chapter 8 and in verse 15. It's pictured as a marriage in Romans chapter 7 and in verse 4 and a grafting into a new tree. Romans chapter 11 and verse 24. New life is beginning. That's the change that takes place. But let's conclude now by talking about how one can be born again. How can one be born again? I know what being born again means. And maybe you're saying, you know what, I come to realize I've not been born again. I've not been born of the water and the spirit. Another way of wording that is I've not become a Christian. Another way of wording that is I'm not a member of the church. Another way of wording that is I'm not yet in a saved relationship. How do I become born again? What's the process? How is one born again? Well, first of all, if it's the same as obeying the gospel, and it is, becoming obedient to the gospel, whatever I have to do to be obedient to the gospel is the very same thing I have to do to be born again. Let's go to Acts 18 and verse 8. We must listen to the teachings of the Spirit. That's how we're born of the Spirit. And that is I need to listen. We need to hear the gospel. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. They didn't become believers until they first heard the message. They're hearing the message that has been given by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So what I'm learning from that, we need to listen and hear the teachings of the Spirit. All right, what do you do with that? Then we must believe the teachings of the Spirit. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe the Spirit's revelation? By the way, that's in the context of Jesus in his discussion with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. It involves repentance. Let's go to Acts 17, 30 and 31. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Cause is appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he's given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. So evidence has been supplied, he's been raised from the dead, and therefore God commands all men everywhere to repent, to make a change of heart, resulting in a change of their life. But furthermore, involved in becoming a Christian is in the idea of confessing or acknowledging one's faith. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. There are many who, in dealing with the steps in the plan of salvation, would omit confession, even some of our own brethren. And yet Romans 10, 9 and 10 said it, you, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, it's essential, it's unto, it leads to salvation. Here is an acknowledgement of that faith that you have. An example could be given in Acts chapter 8 and in verse 37. And then one must be baptized. And I cite John 3, 5. He doesn't mention the word baptism. It talks about being born of the water. We've already demonstrated that refers to baptism. So you see, when I hear the gospel, the teaching of the Spirit, and I believe the gospel, the teaching of the Spirit, I'm being led by the Spirit. I'm being led by the Spirit of God to do what God wants me to do. And the Spirit of God tells me to repent, and so I do that. And He tells me to confess my faith, and I do that. And He tells me to be baptized. And when I do that, I've been born of the water and of the Spirit. And I enter the kingdom, and that indeed is the new birth. Simple study. Simple principles. A first principle. What in, is involved in the new birth? We see a teacher from God demands the new birth. Its meaning is simple. We saw key elements, water and spirit. We saw the changes that take place. And then raise the question, how can one be born of water and of the spirit? Have you been born again? Have you become a Christian? Have you become a child of God? If you're not a Christian, would you become one this evening? Would you be born again? Would you be born of the water and the spirit? Would you listen to the spirit's teaching, follow the spirit's teaching, and as he leads you through his instructions in the word, to be baptized, you'd be born of water and of the Spirit. If you're subject in any way, we hope and trust that you'll come while together we stand and while we sing.